Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of fun with food tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about um, some theories and uh, just have a little bit of, of fun. Because um, food should be fun. Um, and that's kind of why I got into what I do is uh, everybody got really serious about 10 years ago. You know, everybody was watching the Food Network and they thought it was really easy. And uh, everybody was a chef. And um, why I got into uh, molecular gastronomy, which uh, is a horrible term. Um, you don't want to sit down to a bowl of molecular gastronomy. <laughs> but it's a, it's a term used to try to give some kind of name to what we do. Um, but I got into it because I wanted to bring the romance back into dining. Um, I believe if you go out um, and you pay a lot of money for a meal, you should have great food and you should have great service, but there should be an entertainment value. And when I was growing up, that was table side. So I worked in a steakhouse as a kid. Um, we would wheel out the Garadones and make Caesar salads and steak au poivres and uh, Cherry's Jubilee and all that kind of fun stuff. And I always thought that was really cool um, to have that kind of show. Um, and then, like I said, people started to figure out the tricks and started doing more stuff at home. Um, so this allows me to have what I call a bigger bag of tricks. Because uh, for a chef, it's, it's how many tricks you have in your bag. Um, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, we want a special dish or something like that, you look back in your repertoire and you think about stuff that you've done in the past. and uh, 10 years ago, I had 30 things that I could do. I could grill, I could saute, I could freeze, you know, I could do a couple things. Now I have 200 different things that I can do. I can make it into a paper, I can make it into a gas, um, I can freeze it instantly table side. There's just all these cool things that I can do that really stimulate the way that I work and the way that I generate ideas. So, um, a little bit of background on me, I'm, I was born and raised in Breckenridge. Uh, I grew up with a little ski bum, skiing all the time. Uh, my dad was a chef, so I was in kitchens really, really early, dishwashing and prepping and, and doing that kind of stuff. Um, I came down uh, after high school, I went to the Art Institute. Um, I did classical French and Italian and really focused on baking and pastries. Um, and I think that's really what's helped me in this field is I, my brain kind of works a different way because Usually you have chefs that are either chefs or you have pastry chefs. It's really hard to be both because they're two different disciplines. Uh, one of them is, you know, quick, quick, get it out, yell at all the people. And the other one is real basic measurements and getting everything down and it's a, it's a science. Um, so I worked my way through kitchens. I got my first chef job at a place called the Hilltop Cafe out in Golden. Um, I was there for two or three years and I got to go to the James Beard house for the first time. Um, Worked my way through, God, when I think about it now, it's just, I can name off all of these restaurants that I've been in and it's, it's kind of scary. But I ended up at the Westin in Westminster, uh, right down the road over here. Um, and that was about 10 years ago. So um, I showed up there, it was a steakhouse. Um, you know, it was meat and potatoes. I was in Westminster, Colorado. Where is the, where's the big gastronomy hub out there? So, um, so slowly, I you know, developed a great menu. I got on what was called Task Force, and I got sent all over the country opening W's and St. Regis's and all these really cool properties, and worked with a chef that came from Alenia in Chicago, and that's the real progressive restaurant for this type of cuisine, and he's like, dude, you can make avocado sorbet in 30 seconds, and I was like, all right, I'm hooked. So that's how I got introduced to it, went back to the hotel, and just kind of started playing around ever since. So. That's a little bit about me, so um, pictures are a little pixelated, but I'll, I'll describe what we're doing. So uh, up at the hotel, I used to do a presentation every day. We'd have uh, new guests come in, and we'd set everybody up in the lobby. Um, so this was my, uh, I called it an air freshener. So um, all of uh, Starwood properties, they have certain scents. So when you walk into the lobby, they actually pump white tea scent into the lobby. Um, they go that far in branding, you know, all of their stuff. So uh, what I would do is we grab everybody around. Uh, I'd take a balloon. I'd fill it with colored water. Um, I'd add a little bit of carbon dioxide to it, so I'd just blow it up and I'd tie it off. I'd fill a bowl with liquid nitrogen in it, and then I would put the balloon in there and I would spin it rapidly. 
Um, we dubbed this the, the hamster effect because it's like a little hamster wheel going. So you spin it so fastly that it actually freezes on the outside and it leaves the, the inside totally uh, a cavity in the inside. So uh, I would take it out of the balloon and then I would burn a hole in the top and add a little white tea scent to it. And then we would add a little liquid nitrogen to it and the white tea would just you know, permeate all through the, uh, through the lobby that we were doing the presentation. So, um, so this is the definition of molecular gastronomy. The scientific discipline involving the study of physical and chemical process that occurs in cooking. It pertains to the, the me mechanic. I have such a hard time with that word. Mm -hmm. Mechanisms behind the transformation of ingredients in cooking and the social, artistic, and technical components of culinary and gastronomic phenomena in general. Sounds good, right? So um, when I got introduced, I wanted to figure out why this movement was going on. So um, I was lucky enough to go to San Francisco and uh, listen to Herb Fist speak. Um, Herb is one of the founders of molecular gastronomy. Um, so in the 80s, um, they were sitting around a table and uh, they were you know, talking back and forth and, and really starting to ask the questions, why? You know, why do we do the things that we do with food? To give you an example, uh, when I went to culinary school and I started, uh, when you make a stock, they tell you to start with cold water when you make a stock. And you slowly bring it up, and then that's supposed to be the best way to allow all of the uh, you know, coagulation um, to make a really, really good stock. So um, Herb was like, well, does it matter if we use cold water, or does it matter if we use hot water? Because this has been written in Escoffier. This goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. It's taught in culinary school every single day. So he went and he made stock with hot water and he made stock with cold water. He measured the amount of uh, carrageenans that came out of, of, of each of the bones. And it was the exact same amount. So we've been making this recipe for hundreds of years the way that we thought was the best way to make it. But it really made no difference. Um, so. He coined the term molecular gastronomy in 1988 uh, with, hu with Hungarian physicist uh, Nicholas Kurti. Um, so what he was doing, he, he was investigating culinary gastronomical proverbs, sayings, and old wives' tales. So is this the right way to do it? Why have we been doing this for so long? Is this the best way to do it? And for me, that was it. You know, if we can scientifically look at something and see that this is the best way to do it, then that's the way that I want to do it. Not only as a chef, but as a scientist too. Um, so I was really intrigued by, he's taking you know, microscopes and he's analyzing you know, down on a, on a you know, micro level of does this really work. Uh, another example is, is a Verblanc sauce. So when you make a Verblanc sauce, you reduce white wine and then you slowly stir in butter. So what he did is he took butter and he stirred it in with a whisk, and then he took it under a uh, micro uh, telescope or uh, microscope, and he looked at the uh, how the sauce came out, and then he put the butter in and he just shook the pan like this. So instead of beating it with a whisk, he just shook the pan, and when he shook the pan, the the air bubbles actually stayed. Um, and what that meant is when the sauce hit your mouth, there was a there was a small amount of butter that was actually released, there was a popping. So it was a totally different sensation on the same sauce, just making it two different ways. So I thought that was just absolutely mind blowing. So um, he uses uh, new tools and ingredients and methods into the kitchen. Um, so when I went and saw him, this was 10 years ago, he had made a hollandaise machine. And that freaked me out <laughs> because it's coming the day that, you know, the machines are gonna be cooking for us more than uh, you know, we do. So that, that terrified me because hollandaise is a, is a pretty hard process. You, know, you have to have the temperatures right, you have to do the emulsification right for it to work. So for him to say that you could load this stuff into a machine and push a button and have hollandaise you know, come out, it was a little bit worrisome. But he went, in, he went on to say that it's the, it's the responsibility of the human factor to keep the artistic component alive. Um, we might have machines, but it's always going to be these that are going to be the ones that are going to set us apart from what the machines can do. So um, he really embraces, um, you know, the technology, but understands that, 
you know, there, there, there's going to be a stopping point. So um, he uses this to invent new dishes. Um, so, you know, take for example, chicken and waffles. You know, when I thought about chicken and waffles 10 years ago, there was one really good way to make chicken and waffles. And now, wow, when I think chicken and waffles, it's just a crazy old mess up here because, um, you know, we can do it so different, so many different ways. And he, uh, he uses molecular gastronomy to help the general public understand the contrib contribution of science to society. So he's really aligning how food and science um, kind of perceive themselves and how, um, you know, we can use it to make things better. So um, what I took from Herb is uh, I do a school program. So I concentrate on elementary, middle school, and we even do a high school program. So we go in and we show kids how science and food are so closely related. So the first thing I ask kids is, uh, uh, what, is what do uh, pop rocks and photosynthesis have in common? Can anybody say? These are elementary school kids. Carbon dioxide, Carbon dioxide exactly. So it's a process of um, pop rocks, one of my favorite things in the world, um, is actually a sugar that's heated to about 310 degrees. It's put into a vacuum chamber, and then they add carbon dioxide to it. So pop rocks are two ingredients. Um, and I'm such a geek, I actually built my own pop rock machine. So now I make bacon pop rocks and olive oil pop rocks and all this kind of crazy stuff. Uh, but going in, you know, we can, we can stimulate them and we can, you know, show them that when you walk into a grocery store, you know, don't take everything for granted that, that's on that shelf um, because you have, you know, computers and the internet and you can learn how products are made. Um, you know, two or three years ago, um, I was probably the only person in Colorado with a great Twinkie recipe. I had actually spent three months of my life perfecting my Twinkie recipe and then Hostess went out of business and I had email after email after email of chefs asking me for the, the Twinkie recipe. It was, it was kind of hilarious. Um, and by the way, the new Twinkies are horrible if you've had them from the, from the old ones. I know I shouldn't be promoting Twinkies. Um, one of the other great experiences I had is um, I got to go to the New York Academy of Science and present uh, the Miracle Fruit. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But I got to leave, uh, uh, I got to meet Linda Bartoshuk. Um, and she's a professor of dentistry and a member of the Smell and Taste Center in U and at the University of Florida. And uh, she's an expert on taste. And she came up with a theory that there are non-tasters, medium tasters, and super tasters. Okay? So uh, super tasters make up about 30% of the population. And generally, uh, it's, it's kind of cool. The super tasters, they elevate towards... Uh, uh, the food industry. So a lot of chefs, you know, a lot of winemakers, um, they're super tasters. Um, medium tasters, you know, they, they have, you know, great tastes. And then there's non-tasters. So there's some people that, you know, don't, don't taste. Um, and we all have different tastes. So this was really interesting to me because I've always strived to make the perfect dish. You know, is it possible to have 100 people in a room and present a dish and everybody thinks that it's the perfect dish? And the answer is no. <laughs> um, and the reason is, is we all grew up different. Um, you know, my mom was a shake and baker. You know, your mom might have been a griller. So, you know, we have, we all came up with, you know, different, different tastes. We were exposed to different ingredients. Um, so, realistically, it is not possible to hit the mark with everybody um, just because of how everybody's grown up. Um, I did get in a, go ahead. So with the, like the super tasters and medium tasters, I heard something about like, some people are really sensitive that they have more taste buds on their tongue. Is that what you're talking about? Or yeah, the, yeah, the question is, 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 you know, do super tasters have more taste buds? And, and that's pretty much what it boils down to. There's, it's a more concentrated patch of taste buds. Um, and what they do is they put a, they put a dye on your tongue and then they put a little circle and you stick your tongue out and they take a picture and then they have a tech go in and they count exactly how many taste buds you have on the, in the little circle. So they come up with an average on your tongue. And from that they can determine, you know, if you're a super taster, a medium taster, a non-taster. They have a taste lab here um, in Denver at the Nature and Science Museum. 
So if you go there, you can actually go up to the lab. I'm not sure if they were still doing it, but I, I did some work with them where they go in and they can count how many taste buds you have and figure out if you're a super taster or not, which is pretty cool. Um, so your different guests would taste differently your dishes. Exactly, taste differently. And that's, that's the conversation I got into with Linda. So I walked up to her after hearing her taste and I said, okay, so you, in your labs, you can identify salts, you can identify sweets, you can identify all of these, these taste receptors and what they look like on people's tongues. I said, feasibly, could, could somebody walk into a restaurant, could you scan their tongue and figure out what taste buds they have and actually make a recipe towards, her, towards that dish? You should have seen her face when I asked her that. Yeah, she was, and exactly, that would be the way to customize and, and actually make the perfect dish. Because you could have a recipe book and say, you know, this person has less taste buds, will you add a little bit more salt? Or you add a little bit more acidity? Or, you know, you can play around and make sure that, that those people get the, the flavors that they're supposed to. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Um, so the other founding father is uh, Harold McGee. Um, and he pre also presented that night, and I was like a little geek because, you know, I've been reading about these guys, and, and now I get to, you know, present with them. He's the writer of uh, On Food and Cooking. He writes for the New York Times, uh, The Curious Cook, which examines and often debunks uh, conventional kitchen wisdom. So exactly what we we're talking about with her, they go in and just kind of mess around with stuff. Teaches at the French Culinary Institute, um, and. He wants to get greater pleasures out of the food we already like and maybe extending the range of things we are interested in trying. Um, so he gave this really cool presentation about how herbs, um, like five, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, you know, there were some varieties of thyme that were poisonous. Um, and there were you know, just all of these interesting stuff, how you know, certain types of you know, herbs evolve and you know, they do different things because you know, they're trying to survive. Genetically modifying. <laughs> exactly. Genetically modifying themselves, which is pretty cool. Um, so we talk about molecular in your world. So where do we see molecular cooking on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, 40 years ago, microwaves were really, really out of this world. You know, people thought that microwaves gave you cancer. Um, and now there's microwaves in every single house. You know, we use it every single day. So. Um, the same with cornstarch. Um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, not a lot of chefs used cornstarch because they didn't really understand the principles and what it did. But now you see it in every single kitchen and, and used every time. Um, when you go to the grocery store, if you pop, if you start looking at your labels, you know, you're going to see products like tapioca multidextrin, uh, carrageenans, um, agar. Um, you know, these are things that freak people out and they shouldn't. You know, some of them have long names, but they're natural. Um, and that's another thing about what I do is um, I have to make sure that it's safe. You know, I serve you food, but I've probably eaten a thousand times the amount of, you know, these additives that I've given, you know, my customers. So I want to make sure that I'm safe and I want to make sure everybody's safe. So all of my stuff comes from approved sources. Um, you know, we don't use any of the, you know, the really, really, really weird stuff, but um, but yeah, everything's natural. You know, xanthan, come, xanthan gum comes from a, a root of a bush. Um, agar comes from seaweed. Carrageenans come from seaweed. So, um, you know, if these products are found naturally, why wouldn't we use them to enhance the stuff that we do now? So, all right, so we're going to start talking about some of my experiences and kind of how I got from point A to point B. And a lot of it involves the emergency room. Um, they actually knew my name by name. Um, <laughs> At the emergency room, I had her number on speed dial. It was kind of funny. I was there seven times in a year, I think, when I first started this stuff out. So, um, so the first thing I tried to do was, was make a noodle um, out of gelin. So when I heard about gelin, it kind of started piquing my interest. So I used gelatin throughout my whole career. Um, and gelin is just like gelatin, but it won't melt when it's exposed to heat. So if I make a noodle out of gelatin and I put it in soup, it'll just dissolve into the soup. So when they said that gelin has you know, a little bit different properties, I was like, sweet, let's, let's try to use it a little bit. So, so I made an apple puree, or a, like an apple juice. Um, I added gelin to it. So all of these additives, they, get, uh, they, they react in different ways. So some of them you have to hydrate, 
which means you know you hit it with a blender. Some of them you have to heat. Some of them you have to cool. What's the source of gel? Um, gelatin is a natural source too. Um, gelatin comes from uh, you know animal bones, but gelatin is that is is a natural source. I'll have to look that up. But um, so we mix that up, and then uh, we put it in a syringe, and then we we push it into a hose. Okay, and then we put the hose into ice cold water, and what it does is it sol the noodle solidifies. So then we take that syringe with air in it, and then we just push it, and then out pops a noodle. So we got this really cool apple noodle. That's that's what's on the top. So the finished dish was uh, apple noodles with smoked watermelon, and then we did some uh, curried lamb on top and a little bit of cilantro. So we were at the hotel one day. We had this group come in for for about 300 people. They're like, we really love this dish. Can we do this for about 300 people? And I was like, I gotta push noodles for 300 people. So uh, what I normally do is I think about how I can, you know, create it faster and, and do it a little bit different. So I made my own noodle machine. So uh, I took a CO2 tank. Um, I added a, a couple hoses to it. You know, there was a, a shutoff valve so we could, you know, push the uh, apple juice in. It would solidify, and then we opened up another valve. And then we open the carbon dioxide and you have the noodle, you know, sh actually literally shoot out the other end. Um, so I was filling it and uh, the, uh, just kind of pushing it a little bit too hard and the, the puree came yeah, right into my eye. So I shut my eye and it instantly gelled because it hits that cold. So I open my eye and there's literally a layer of apple juice sitting on my eye. So I finally, you know, I, I pick all that out. I go to the hospital and that's what I was left with was eye drops and, a, and an eye patch and so some like Vicodin. Ice water? Yeah, that's just ice water that you set it in. Exactly. And that's pretty much what I did at the hotel is make my own equipment. So I did. I always get my meals finished. Um, so uh, there's some new toys that we get to play with when we're cooking this way. Uh, liquid nitrogen, which we'll play around with a little bit later. Um, the top left is what's called an immersion circulator. So they've used this in the medical industry. Um, it's used to test blood, to coagulate blood. Um, and what you can do is you can dial in to the tenth of a degree on the temperature. So imagine setting your, your, your water to 148.2 degrees. And that's exactly what I do for those eggs. They're cooked at 148.2 degrees. So normally eggs take about 12 to 14 minutes when they're boiling to do hard boiled. These eggs take 65 minutes to cook. Um, and you pop them out of the shell and it's the best, most perfectly poached egg you've ever had in your life. Um, and I can make, I just did, I actually did Mother's Day brunch for the Colorado Rapids yesterday. And we did uh, Benedict's for 350 so, people, just like this. 0.2 degrees made a big difference? Yeah, so 148.2 degrees is different than an egg cooked at 148.4 degrees. Oh, okay. And that's crazy that, as a chef, I can now dial in my temperatures that precise. So that piece of cooking equipment is also used for sous vide, if you've ever heard of that. So sous vide is the process of putting items in bags with seasonings and butters and stuff, and then sealing that up. <laughs> and cooking them at a very low temperature for a very long time. So we cook short ribs for five days in a water bath. So it's like in a little jacuzzi. Are you making it stir? No. Yeah, it, it, it stirs itself. So there's a little water pump on the bottom that, that actually rotates all the water. So um, I constantly have stuff in my circulator. So there's home, home immersion circulators coming out. Are they as effective? Yeah, for, uh, for home circulators, um, there's units coming out that are about 200, 250 bucks, and they're perfect for home uses because you're not going to do like a whole quarter cow. But they have that same kind of calibration. Yeah, exactly. The same tenth of a degree. Same procedure. Yep. On the bottom is an industrial vacuum sealer. So you, you're probably used to seeing the little food saver vacuum sealers. So this is called a chamber vacuum sealer. So when you use the vacuum sealers, uh, if you have any liquid in it, it pulls out the liquid and you don't get a good seal on it. So what this does is it seals it and then it changes the vacuum pressure outside, inside, and then it sucks out all the air. So everything's in the bag. Um, so this one I had up at the hotel, it was, it was $7,000 when I bought it. And of course I worked for Starwood, so I could buy whatever I want. So I just bought one the other day. Uh, they've come down in price, so I got it for 1200 bucks. So but six years later, I finally got all my toys back. 
Um, and then this, that's just a picture of some of the uh, nitrogen sorbets that we make um, out of the bowl. We'll do a little bit of that later too. All right, so we're gonna talk about liquid nitrogen. We'll do, we'll feed you guys a little bit. Um, we'll talk about some of the, the textures that we get from it. Top left is called the world's coldest beer. So uh, you take a pint glass, you fill it with liquid nitrogen, you let all the nitrogen evaporate. So the glass is actually about 120 degrees below zero. You take a beer and you slowly pour it in, and it actually creates a slushy on the outside. It's the coldest beer that you can have. So I have a tank of nitrogen at my house. I just <laughs> I drink a glass of beer that way. Um, so the middle picture up there is a dehyd dehydrated ratatouille. So we just put all the ratatouille ingredients in a dehydrator and then put those in liquid nitrogen so you get this cool effect with them. Uh, in the middle there is called space foam. So that's a uh, mixture of uh, a simple syrup, heavy cream, and gelatin that we put in a whipped cream canister. And my friend Mike there is eating one of those so you get the big plumes of smoke coming out. You guys will get to try that in a minute here. Um, so we've got a, a nice, uh, that's a strawberry yuzu sorbet we used to do at the hotel. Uh, frozen s'mores. Uh, that bottom picture is, is the spheres that we were talking about. So that's actually a watermelon and a beet sphere. Um, so we can actually stack them up and fill them with stuff and make them look like ice cream cones and different textures. So the quantity is small enough that it doesn't freeze you or drop your mouth, correct? Uh, the, the big thing that you have to look at when you're looking at, text, at uh, the different textures is, is the amount of air that's in each of them. Uh, it has to be more than 70%. So you think about stuff with lots of air, and that's like uh, Rice Krispie Treats, Cheetos, uh, stuff with lots of air. If it, if it doesn't, and there's a lot of moisture in there, when you put it in your mouth, it'll burn you instantly. So yeah, so you just you got to be careful of, of what you do. On the bottom is uh, chicken and waffles. We were just talking about chicken and waffles. I forgot that picture was in there. So waffles and chicken, and then we did an exploding whipped cream on top that was actually done in liquid nitrogen. So, um, so nitrogen is minus 320 degrees. Uh, it's the third coldest liquid that we produce as humans. Liquid oxygen and liquid helium are the two other coldest things. Um, if you want to learn more about this, absolute zero is the topic that you want to take a look at. And it's, Nobody has reached that yet. Yes, we're, we were close. In Boulder, we came uh, within a millionth of a degree in 1996. And they actually think that the Big Bang might have been the only time that absolute zero happened. Um, so that might be the violent reaction, but um, just absolutely fascinating subject. Um, it's the reason why we have air conditioning. It's the reason why we have skyscrapers and all of this, you know, modern stuff is because man's quest to get colder and colder and colder and colder. So, and this happened in the 1880s. I mean, they were pressurizing gases in glass. People were dying, but we were just trying to, you know, get to this point, which is really cool. So, so essentially. Uh, liquid nitrogen is, it looks just like boiling water. And that's pretty much how you have to think of it. It's boiling water, but on the other side of the spectrum. So if we were to do minus 320 over here and it was oil, we could fry chicken fingers in it, you know, and some other fun stuff. Um, yes, I've had many fun burns. Yes. I'll show you my thumbs later. They're a different size. So, uh, it evaporates quickly. So it's, uh, uh, it's constantly going from a liquid back into a gas again. Um, it boils at about the same rate as boiling water. So if we had boiling water and we had liquid nitrogen sitting, it would evaporate pretty much at the same rate. So, so we talked a little bit about uh, the texture earlier. And uh, Cheetos are perfect because they, they keep it in there. Um, so when you bite it, um, just open your mouth and let the, the cold gases expel. Everybody signed the waiver when you came in, right? <laughs> Nitrogen is not safe to eat. Oh, it's, it'll freeze you instantly. <laughs> so, and I'll tell you this story as you guys are eating Cheetos. Um, so three or four years ago in Canada, there was a, there was a girl and she was, on her birthday party, and uh, she went and had a couple of uh, nitrogen drinks, and the bartender didn't take 
he didn't let all the nitrogen evaporate. So the girl actually drank a little bit of nitrogen, and it, nitrogen evap it, uh, um, it uh, expanded 2,000 times its volume per second. So just imagine if that hits your stomach. Yeah. So it's the responsibility of the chef or the bartender or whoever's handling it to make sure that we're doing it properly. Yeah, get your photos out. The, the gases are entering your system, for sure. Just the liquid is not. And that's because all the liquid, it just falls right out of the Cheeto. Um, it doesn't trap it at all. And that's just because of its texture. Um, so like whipped cream does really good because it's more than 70% air. So there's just some really good structures that do really good in nitrogen and some that don't. So um, you just have to be safe. Um, you know, when I first got this stuff, I was dropping everything into it. You know, jelly beans and, you know, popping stuff in my mouth. We were doing a mountain fair once, and this guy brought up these beautiful raspberries. He's like, I just picked these raspberries in this meadow out there. Would you freeze them in nitrogen, and we'll see what it does? I was like, sure. So I froze them in nitrogen. I picked it up, and I put it on my tongue. And it's a Christmas story, yeah. So if that ever happens, you pour li you're supposed to pour liquid on there so it slowly thaws. I just ripped that sucker off. And a quarter of my t tongue came with it. So, yeah. There, every... Every single day, I have learned a lesson about how to handle nitrogen and what not to do. And I mean, you just, you, you got to be really, really, I mean, it's just like fryer oil. You wouldn't drink fryer oil. You know, you wouldn't pour fryer oil on somebody. You just have to be really careful. And the two uh, groups that I have to be most careful around are kids and drunk people. Because they all want to put their hands in the nitrogen. And that's all the people I cook for, pretty much, is, is kids and drunk people. So. Yeah, gas is fine to ingest, um, to a point. Um, so if we were in a room and there's all of this nitrogen gas in the room, we would take one breath and we would pass out on the floor. We would take another breath and the nitrogen would deprive our cells of oxygen and we would die. So we also have to do this in a very well-ventilated room. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of different things that, that have to come in. So I was at the lesson one day, and uh, we had this lady come in, and she did her little chocolate fountain. You guys know the chocolate fountains? I hate chocolate fountains. Yeah. So I was like, I want to come up with a new presentation for desserts. So um, I started thinking about sixth grade science class, because that's how I come up with a lot of my ideas. And I thought of superconductors. And actually, the first thing I thought of is sulfur hexafluoride. So sulfur hexafluoride is a, a gas that has really big air molecules, OK? So if you take this and you take this sulfur hexafluoride and you put it in a fish tank, it will actually settle on the bottom. And if you take textures that are lighter than air, you can put them on top and they'll float. But the problem is sulfur hexafluoride is one of the worst greenhouse gases. And it's really, really expensive, so that was out. Toxic yeah, it's, it's really, really hard to work with. Like one little, one little bottle of sulfur hexafluoride is almost 600 bucks. So yeah, it was, it was a good idea, but it was quickly defunct. So I thought about superconductors, and I started researching them. And one night at the Weston, I emailed about 35 scientists all around the United States. I said, hey, I'm a chef in Westminster, Colorado. I want to float food. Will you help me out? You know how many people email me back? Zero. <laughs> yeah, they were scared, exactly. So then I emailed uh, Robert Themerad. He works at uh, uh, Thedia Labs in Germany. And they made all of the superconducting trains in Japan. So I emailed them and I said, hey, I, I wanted to see if you wanted to help me out. I want to float food. And I get this really cool email back. And he's like, yes! I thought that, that's awesome. So we worked on it for about... About three months, we sent ideas back and forth together, and we came up uh, with a couple different plates, and then this is, this is the bigger than one that we use. So as soon as these superconductors get about minus 280 degrees, we can take a rare earth magnet, 
and then we have to find a field, just like the magnetic field that goes around the Earth, and as soon as we can, it'll float for us. So why does the chef have a, a superconductor, right? Because I hate chocolate fountains. So what we do now is we make these really good chocolate truffles, or we make chocolate dipped strawberries, and we take them and we put them right on top of the plate and we spin them. And then the guests walk up and they can come and they can pick off their own floating food. So we've come up with a whole new fun presentation. We do this for weddings. Um, you know, I've done this in Canada. Uh, so yeah, it's just a real fun, unique, different presentation. So um, you have to keep nitrogen in the basin. So we have to have an attendant there constantly pouring it in. Yeah, you can push down on it. It'll actually withstand 120 pounds of pressure. So um, about six weeks ago, we got a suckling pig, so a small pig. We cooked it off. We put magnets in four different places in the pig, and we, float, we floated the cooked pig in midair. So as people walked up, I was cooking off the pieces. Of, I was cutting off the pieces of cooked pork for them as they walked up. So if you were 120 pounds and you could balance yourself, you, it, it would actually float you, which is pretty cool. So, actually, we've lost the. I talk too long. What's that? You know, the first part of my life, I worked with heat, and I really screwed my hands up. And now, the last 10 years, I've worked with cold and really, really screwed my hands up. So I don't have the best feeling in my hands. I mean, they still work, but yeah, I can, I can grab a lot of stuff that I probably shouldn't. So there's the floating plate story. So there's a, uh, that's a pate fruit that we got. So that's just like a, a fancy, you know, kind of jelly bean that we got floating. And that's a chocolate truffle that we have on the other side. Um, so let's talk about agar. So agar is, uh, comes from the Orient. It's been around for 3,000 years. It's from seaweed. Um, so I, yeah, there you go. Uh, so I have uh, 13 and nine year old girls. Um, I was playing Legos with them one day and my youngest daughter wouldn't eat her vegetables. So A plus B equals edible Legos, right? So we made broccoli Legos and blueberry Legos and all these fun Legos. And I, I would just give her a bag of Legos and she would play with them and then eat them. So, you know, how fun is that presentation? Until I thought about that kids might associate real Legos with food. And yeah, the liability with that, I stopped making those right away. Um, the other thing that we make with them, uh, that's a uh, passion fruit crepe. So think about how we usually make a crepe. We make a batter, a cold batter, right? And we put it in a hot pan, correct? So to make this crepe, I took that and I reversed it. Okay, so then I made a hot batter and I put it into a cold pan. So I made the passion fruit juice, I put a little bit of agar in there and boiled it. And then we took our pan and we dipped the pan in liquid nitrogen and then we ladled it in just like a crepe and it froze. So then we were able to put that out, we put a little bit of, I think it was like a vanilla whipped cream on top and then we garnished it with a little bit of fruit. Um, it, as soon as it thaws out, it's the texture that I want. So it actually, it almost came out like a gel, like a uh, fruit roll-up. Um, it was a little bit uh, more of a jelly consistency, but it was it was really really good. And that's the thing is is when you make dipping dots, they're so cold that you have to put them in the freezer to heat them up so you can eat them. It doesn't sound right, right? So it's so cold that you actually have to temper them before you can eat them. So you have to think about temperature a lot. Um, gel enough, we talked a little bit ago about the apple noodles, so this is a tobiko noodle that we made, which is a little bit different, you can do some crazy sauces with it. Um, on top is an olive oil terrine, um, so I've never been able to solidify oil into a terrine before, and we were actually able to do it and separate uh, the oils and waters out, it was beautiful, it came out really, really cool. Um, Methyl cell. So this is, a, this is a weird daddy of the additives that I use. So this is a chemical. This is made by Dow Chemical. <laughs> yeah, it's a methyl cellulose. And this is the hardest thing for me to explain and kind of get my head around because there's so many different kinds. So there's like a high acidity, a medium, a low. There's hundreds of different kinds of methyl cellulose. 
And they're in tons of different products and breads and, and different stuff. But just kind of getting your, your head around how to be able to use them and, and what to use them for, um, it just takes a little bit of time. But, but once you get it, it's kind of cool. So that's a baked potato soup on the top left. So when you would come into my restaurant, you would get um, some broth and some potatoes. And then uh, we would give you a syringe with sour cream with a little bit of methyl cell. And once you push that syringe into the, the broth, it would make a noodle for you. It would make a sour cream noodle for you. And the cool thing about methyl cell is you add just a very little bit. So that sour cream noodle is actually 99.8% sour cream. So it's a really good flavor. It's a really intense flavor. Uh, um, that gels at, I think, about 100 degrees. Yeah, so it's not, it's not a very high temperature that it gels. Um, uh, no, the methyl cell is heat activated, that one is. So as long as it's above 100 degrees, then it'll gel for you. But if you were to do the noodle in cold water, it would just all fall apart. So it all has to kind of come together. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but the top right is, is olives. So I, I diced up like Kalamata olives and green olives and black olives and mixed them with a little bit of methyl cell. And then I made a ball out of it and dropped it in a little bit of water, a little bit of boiling water. So it created a skin on the outside and it was like this kind of weird creature that was kind of cool. Um, the bottom right is a product I developed for uh, the Nestle Corporation. So they came to me and said, uh, we want to do something different at Quiznos. Uh, we want to develop a, a new sandwich. So I went in one day and I was like, there's, there's nobody doing Hollandaise. On a, on a sandwich. Wouldn't it be cool to have like a hollandaise steak sandwich at, at Quiznos? So I was able to take, make hollandaise sauce, add uh, methyl cell and some carrageenans to it, and then we freeze it in a sheet. So it looks just like a sheet of cheese. So what they do is they put that sheet right on top of the meat, and as they send it through the, the little toaster, it actually turns into hollandaise. So we've stabled it so that it, you know, when it melts, it, it'll actually turn into the sauce. I know, I sold it to them. I don't know what they do with it, but. So, if wanted to try playing with any of these there's tons and tons of companies that you can order this stuff from. Um, I use, when I was at the hotel, I used uh, this company called Le Sanctuaire in San Francisco. Again, because money didn't matter and I could buy whatever I wanted. Um, now I use a company called Chef Rubber, um, and they have great, they have additives and. Up. There goes the, didn't put enough nitrogen in there. Um, and they have additives and molds and nitrogen supplies and all this great stuff. So Chef Rubber is a really good um, place where you can look. There's great cookbooks out now. Uh, Modernist Cuisine, if you guys seen that thing, that's that guy that made that cookbook that's like this thick that takes four years to get to you or whatever. Yeah. So when you get a bunch of money, you can build a $2 million kitchen and screw around with cutting things in half all day. Um, but uh, Alenia, uh, it's only like 40 bucks, and it has really, really good basic recipes to kind of get you, 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 get you going. Uh, A-L-I-E-N-A, I believe. But again, for me, it was locking myself in a closet for over a year before I served any of this stuff to anybody. And that's where chefs really kind of get in trouble as they pick this stuff up and they do something to make it look cool, but it doesn't taste good. And in, in all actuality, it has to taste good for it to, to be functional as food. So we can make things look pretty, but it's, it's got you know, to have something. Uh, lecithin, uh, so that's egg yolks that have been dried out into a powder. And then egg white powder, so we have the yolk and the white that have been, just been dehydrated. And we get all these cool textures. So, uh, that's a potato with a little piece of bacon, and then that's a carrot foam on top. So we can make that carrot foam stand up. Almost looks like a hat on top of it. Um, on the right is a frozen chocolate air. So we took a, a chocolate and water, which they told me never to do in culinary school. Mix chocolate and water, and I do it all the time now. Chocolate and water and a little bit of egg white powder, um, and it makes these bubbles. And you can take the bubbles off and spoon them and set them right on a tray in the freezer, and it'll freeze into chocolate air. So you give people spoons of this and it just, I mean, it literally, by the, right when it hits your mouth, the warmness of your mouth just kind of explodes it all. Yeah, exactly. And then the bottom one is, is what we call bubbles. And we use this just an absolute ton. So um, I was sitting at my aquarium tank one day and I was noticing um, 
the refractor in the back was making all these really cool bubbles that were coming up. So I thought back to my, I got a lot of weird stories, I'm sorry. Um, Breckenridge, we used to come down to the mall in Denver. That was the big thing to do when I was a kid. And we used to go to Orange Julius. So, um, and we would sit there and it was really cool because they would put this much liquid in that blender and they would hit that button and it would pop up to this much. And I was always fascinated, you know, what, what makes it do that? It's egg white powder. So that's what gives it volume. So I took a liquid and I added egg white powder and then xanthan gum. So the xanthan gum kind of thickens it and stabilizes it. And then I took that aquarium pump that I have and I put it in there and it makes these perfect little soap bubbles that'll actually keep their shape for up to eight hours. So we take, uh, we make a margarita and we make jalapeno bubbles that's and we put it on top. <laughs> yeah, that's at room temperature. Uh, raspberry bubbles for the top of Sundays. Uh, just all these fun things. How do you make the foam? So you make a tea. Um, so, like, for example, if I'm making jalapeno bubbles, I take uh, jalapenos, cut them in half, put them in water, boil it, and then I let it sit for half an hour. I take those jalapenos out, I add the egg white powder and just a little touch of xanthan. I put it in a blender. You add the aquarium pump and you're ready to go. It's a party. Um, Activa. Uh, Activa you can take and you can glue any protein to any protein. With Activia. With Activia. It, not the Activia from the yogurt. <laughs> so this is totally different. So um, I was actually exposed to this about 15 years in culinary school. I went down to the Olympic training facility and they actually take all of the, the ends and pieces of the tenderloin and they'll glue them together. <laughs> New recipe. Yeah. So, um, I use it to make a zebra steak. So that's what's on the right there. So I took a, a chicken breast and glued it to a tenderloin and glued it to a chicken breast and glued it to a tenderloin and I made this log and I froze it, right? And then I put it on a slicer and I sliced it this way and you come up with a pattern that actually looks like a zebra. So when you sear it, it's, it's pretty cool. What's it taste like? It's, it's awesome. It's this caramelized chicken and you know, the chicken gets, you want to get the chicken cooked but the, the beef stays about mid-rare, mid-medium. It, it, it has no flavor to it whatsoever. But you have to be really careful when you use it because it glues any protein to any protein. <laughs> well, not, it, they have to be kind of raw, but imagine inhaling that. So I always use a respirator when I'm working with that stuff. Um, on the bottom left is what we call a shrimp sheet. So we take shrimp and puree it and add the Activa to it and then we roll it out into a really, really thin paste and put it in a steamer and we can make these sheets that are just microscopic thin. And again, it's 99.8% shrimp. So if I have somebody that comes in and says, I'm gluten free, you know, I have Celerac, I have all of this stuff, I can make a shrimp lasagna for you because I know that this is, you know, it's pure. Well, so once it's, once it's cooked, it's totally activated and it's not, it's not like that. It's, a, it's in its raw form that, that it can glue stuff together. Um, there's, there's one for cheese too. Um, so that's a gnocchi, um, just kind of in a nice dish up there. That's just ricotta that's been glued together with some spices and stuff like that. So, um, and all you do for those is you put it in a bag and you just cut little gnocchis as they drop out of the bag. And as soon as they hit the water, they're ready to go. Um, this is the one you probably heard about the most. It's alginate and calcium chloride. So this is how we make caviar. Um, that's how you make the dental impression material. That's exactly the same. The alginate? Thing. Yeah, alginate's, yeah, alginate's used just in, if, if there's ever a zombie apocalypse, you can take alginate and it makes this really kind of gooey, sloppy stuff that you can put on the ground that they would slip and, I, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I sodium alginate and calcium chloride. So this this is just a simple chemical reaction that was uh, uh, this is again goes back to El Bulli, which was one of the founding restaurants of this. So Fernand Andrea in Spain um, in the 80s, they were getting the tapas movement going, and this is really when when this stuff started to really become um, because they were trying to fit as much flavor as they could into one bite of food or a couple bites. That's what tapas are. So you know. They experimented in diff different things and the chef was just playing around one day and they, they came up with, you know, being able to make caviar. And honestly, the first time I made caviar, I mean, when you look at it and you can make something that looks like it came out of a fish, like exactly, it's pretty, 
pretty awesome. And when you can make it taste like root beer, <laughs> that's pretty awesome too. So on the top dish is uh, avocado and crab with mango and then there's some strawberry caviar on top. Um, the bottom right is uh, actually what's called reverse spherification. So if we take, um, usually we take the alginate and add that to the puree and then we drip that into a bath of calcium chloride. The reverse is we take the calcium chloride and add it to the substance, whatever we want to do. Um, and then we drop it in a bath of calcium chloride and we can make these spheres. Um, so uh, if you ever go to a steakhouse, you get you know, the, the demi-gloss on the plate. So what I used to do is I made the demi-gloss into spheres and then we put that into the microwave and we put it on the plate. And when the guest pops into it, then all the sauce leaks out and the sauce is warm because you put it in the microwave and it gets heated from the inside out, which is pretty cool. And then uh, new tools. So we've got spoons with holes in it. That's really weird. Everybody always asks me, why do you have spoons with holes in them? So you can get the caviar out without the liquid. So we're, we're developing all these kind of tools as we go along. Um, so I had a bunch of pictures up here of, of their dishes, but they didn't come through, but we'll talk a little bit about the chef. So Ferdinand Andrea, like we said, El Bulli, Spain, um, he was the founder. Um, if you want to go to his restaurant, it's closed. Um, it was uh, over $600 to eat there without the wine pairing. There was a chef for every guest. So this, the, the restaurant seated 62 people, there was 63 chefs. Not service people, there was 63 chefs in the kitchen cooking your meal. Um, I did not have the chance to go there. Um, I worked with many, did you have the chance? No, no, the thing is you might get to. Uh, Carlos Reed says they're opening the restaurant for a year to do a film. Very cool, yeah, and he has just a ton of projects. Uh, he talks, uh, he does a lecture at Harvard. Um, they're talking about opening it up some, you know, some different styles of restaurants. So um, he's definitely the guy to, you know, to, to take note of. Um, then you have Heston Blumenthal. He's from the Fat Duck in London. Um, he was, uh, they, had, they got the best restaurant in 2008. Um, so he took over this little British pub. You know, he went in and kind of cooked their food and then he started, uh, you know, talking to scientists and other chefs and uh, really started, you know, you know, going at it. Um, he's famous for this uh, uh, licorice salmon. So he makes a, a, a licorice puree and coats it around a salmon and sous vide it. And he makes like parsnip uh, um, breakfast cereal and all this really cool stuff. He's really, really playful and he looks like me too. <laughs> um, Willie DeFries from uh, WD50 in New York. Uh, this was the only place that I have been to personally um, to have a meal. So we went and sat down and had a 10 course meal. Um, I hated it. So I can actually stand up here and say, one of the best people that, that practices this stuff, I, I did not have a great meal when I went there. And what it was for me is everything was just deconstructed too much. Um, when I go out to eat, you know, if I have a steak, I want to know that it's a steak. You know, I don't necessarily want that steak made into paper or you know, some of the other funny stuff that I do. And, and people find that weird when I say it, but I think we all, we, we crave that that quality that, you know, we, we want to know what we're eating. Um, and then we can kind of go a little bit crazy for there. So, you know, out of the 11 courses we had, two of them were just absolutely amazing, just blew me out of the water. And the rest of them I really just didn't get a connection with. And again, it's that perfect dish. It's, you know, really hard to nail with everybody. But it was a great experience seeing him and seeing how he does food. And, you know, it really, it really brought me along. And then we have uh, Grant uh, from Alenia in Chicago. So uh, Grant, about three or four years into opening Alenia, uh, he got throat cancer. Um, and it was, it's still up in the debate, you know, if uh, he got cancer because he was using all of these additives or, you know, he what exactly was going on. <laughs> exactly. So, um, but the, the way that I think about it is, you know, we all kind of sacrifice for our jobs sometimes and, you, you know, your own yeah, I mean, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't be where I am right now without experimenting and doing the things and we all take a certain amount of risk and all we can do is educate ourselves and make sure that, you know, we're trying to do the right thing on a daily basis. So, um, so these are a few ideas. Um, so I'm opening a company in the next month called Supper Bell. So we've taken all these uh, recipes from chefs 
um, all around the country and we're going to make their meals and then we're going to deliver them. And it's going to have a really cool tech uh, uh, component to it. So all the chefs are going to wear Google Glass. So you can get on an app and see all your food being made. And then we're going to have all these really cool, fun presentations. So uh, when you order focaccia from me, um, you're not going to get uh, butter on the side. You're going to get a chapstick container full of butter. <laughs> so this is something I developed in the hotel. When I get a steak at a steakhouse, and you get that nice piece of compound butter and it's always melted. That always pisses me off, you know, because you're paying 80 bucks for a steak. So at the steakhouse, we would take chapstick containers and we'd fill it with a Tasmanian pepper butter. Um, and then we would serve that on the side so the guests could actually lather their steak. And then you'd see a lot of these people actually take it home. Or I'd have people email me and say they actually put it in their purse and were lathering on <laughs> lipstick the next day. Um, so that's the, the top left is the first dish that I've ever done. Um, and that was a, that's a miso soup. Um, so I took all of the ingredients that are in miso soup and dehydrated them and put them in pill form. Capsules. capsules. Um, and the capsules are made out of gelatin. So again, I would serve you a bowl of hot water. You would take the, the capsules, you put it in the hot water and they would all melt into a nice miso soup. Did you try olive oil and I, no, I didn't. Really? Yeah. And it actually thickens the soup. The gelatin thickens the soup in the pill a little bit too. And again, we would squeeze in the noodle and then a little bit of, uh, um, of the, the shaved pork would go in there too. Um, on the bottom is a, is a picture of Miracle Fruit. Um, I actually am the corporate chef for the Miracle Fruit Man out of Florida. Um, so if you guys have never ever had the Miracle Fruit, um, it's a fruit that's grown uh, in tropical climates. Uh, you'll, you'll never find it here. You, you can't grow it here, I've already tried. Um, it looks just like an elongated cranberry. So you put it on your palate, and what it does is it changes the way that you taste. So anything that's sour or bitter, it becomes sweet. So the first time it was discovered was in like 1680. Uh, the conquistadors were in Africa, and they noticed all the native people were eating this before they would eat their dinner. Um, and they, they figured out that uh, all of the greens that these people were eating were really bitter. So they were actually taking the miracle fruit before so they could stomach um, you know, the greens that they had. So um, fast forward to 1960, uh, the, the sugar industry, they put up over $5 billion to try to eradicate the miracle fruit plant and stevia. Uh -oh. <laughs> so you know where stevia is now, right? So you see it all over the place, which I hate stevia. It's not a good flavor, but yeah, it's not good. But uh, the miracle fruit is now, it's becoming more abundant. You guys are going to start seeing it in the next 10 years. But what we've done is we've developed a whole program for schools where we give a miracle fruit to the kids as they walk in for lunch. And then we've taken all of the sugar and all of the bad stuff out of the meals that they eat. And we replace it with vinegar and, and, uh, and like lemon juice and stuff like that. And that's what makes it taste sweet. So imagine having an applesauce that has no sugar in it whatsoever. That's like really, really good applesauce. So, you know, hopefully in, in, in a little while, you know, we'll all be using the miracle fruit a little bit more. So. It's a miracle. Um, so where is molecular going in the future? Um, and this is always a really, really funny slide to me because um, you know, I made this presentation up six or seven years ago and I kind of go back and, and do stuff. But seven or eight years ago, I was talking about how I thought in 30 years from now, how important molecular was going to be because we're not going to have all of the variety that we have now. Um, you know, growing regions are going to change. Climate's going to change. Imagine that we only have 30 different products we have to cook with. Now we have 3,000. So we have a tomato. Well, it's going to be the job of the chef to take that tomato and turn it into hundreds of different things if we're only able to grow that tomato. And what's really scary to me is, is this is coming true now. Um, you know, I was listening to NPR when I was coming in. They're talking about this big glacier sheet now breaking off. Well, and yeah, water levels are going to come up 10 to 15 feet. You know, when I was a kid, they, were, they didn't even talk about this. You know, 10 years ago, they said it was going to happen in 300 years. It's happening right now. So, you know, imagine, you know, what we're going to go through as far as how we're going to uh, sustain ourselves. It happened uh, five or six years ago in China. They couldn't grow enough rice. You know, there was a huge shortage there and, you know, people died because of it. So, um, you know, it's just stuff that we have to think about. Um, and space exploration is going to be a huge thing, too. How do we preserve food so 
you know, we can go out and find different stars or planets or, or different, you know, ways to inhabit. So, um, that's the bottom of that page. But uh, our website's The Inventing Room. Um, uh, we do Facebook stuff. We do lots of uh, pop-ups. Uh, we're famous for our pop-up donut shop. So I'll take over our friend's restaurant. We make really crazy donuts for like three or four days. So, uh, but yeah, we just like to have fun. And I think that's kind of where we all need to get back to is, you know, enjoying our food and stop taking things so seriously. So, um, have, have you experimented with 3D food printers? I have. Um, I have a, I have the new sugar printer on order from Holland. So that's supposed to, that's in beta right now. That's supposed to come out in three months. So it prints in sugar. So I can take, uh, you know, a picture of you and I can make a cake topper that would be exactly out of sugar. Um, you know, we can make three dimensional. Uh, I have a friend that has a, a 3D printer. So um, I did an event for Nike uh, about five weeks ago. So I took their swoosh, um, made it into a, a 3D design, and then I made that into a silicone mold. And then I could take whatever food I want and make it into the swoosh. So we made chocolate and jellies and... Uh, we made a Caesar salad swoosh and, you know, all this really, really cool stuff. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's whatever you want to kind of take it and manipulate it into. Um, our current project, um, I have a bass drum, so off of a drum set. I built a smoker on the side of it, so I'm able to fill this, this bass drum full of smoke. Um, and then when you push on the front, you can actually have a ring of smoke go out and travel across the room. So we're going to have a station on the other side and a guy with a dome. So the guy's going to shoot smoke across the room. The guy's going to catch it in a dome and put it on top of the food to smoke it. <laughs> and then uh, the last thing we're working on is, is snowing flavors. So imagine walking into a room and putting your head up and having it snow creme brulee snow into your mouth or roast beef snow or something like that. So we're trying to figure out ice crystals and how they form. And, um, you, we have to clarify the mixture because imagine you're wearing a nice white dress. You don't want you know, red snow all over you. The snow has to melt here, or it has, it has to be snow here and it has to melt by the time it, it, hits, your, it hits your feet or you don't want a puddle of water. So we're using glycerin to help uh, you know, melt off the moisture as it comes down. So it's really amazing. You just kind of, you, you take it, you try to apply scientific principles to it and uh, you screw up a whole bunch, uh, but the stuff that you know works out, um, it's it's a lot of fun. You so recycle the glycerin. Exactly. Heat it up. And and get it back out again. It. Exactly. So the last thing I'm going to make for you guys today is a coconut sorbet. Uh, so it's just going to be coconut milk and a little bit of simple syrup. Um, and the reason why we make it with nitrogen is it freezes the crystal so quickly. So when we're talking about ice cream, the smaller the crystal, the better. Um, and the way to achieve that is, is, the, is the quickness in which you do it. So, um, and it's the same uh, with geology, which is kind of cool. Um, say we have uh, magma coming out of a volcano. The quicker the magma cools, the, the smaller the crystal is going to be. Um, so it, it all just kind of ties together. It's just fascinating. So all this is is uh, coconut milk. And then simple syrup is equal parts sugar and water that have just been heated. No, I'm a chef. I'm prepared. <laughs> That's a sugar syrup? Yeah. So, when I was a kid at the farm in Kansas, I had to sit on that crank. Did you guys ever have to do that? Yeah. For an hour and 15 minutes to get ice cream? So when I was told I could do it in 45 seconds, I was a little intrigued. So how do I know how much nitrogen to add? You can't add too much. If it freezes, I have to sit here and talk to you guys for 45 minutes while I thaw it out, which is horrible. Um, I can tell by you know, the strain on it, how thick it's getting. So if it's too much, you dump it up? Yes, and what's really cool is it's a solid and I can actually tip the bowl and the liquid will come out, yeah. So look, we got sorbet that quickly. Yeah. So it's a, yeah, but feel it's, I mean, it's a little bit cold, but it's not bad. So this is a, a vacuum bowl. 
So there's a, a layer of nothing inside, and what that allows is the cold transfer to, to happen. Exactly. So if we were to do this in a regular bowl, it would freeze into a solid block pretty quickly. But since it's a vacuum bowl, you know. So there's all these things that have to really come together to make something well. And I have spoons, but they're back here. You almost got me. Yeah, I used to have to wear this microphone for the demo at the Westin. And one time I left it on and went to the bathroom, of course. Yeah, they, they didn't let me wear a microphone after that. So does anybody else have any questions? Yes. Yeah, the first time I made uh, ice cream, I used the, I put plastic gloves on there, and the plastic will freeze, and it will give you a really bad burn. Um, so then I tried welding gloves. So those are the big blue gloves that they use. What happens with that is the little blue pieces of cloth will come out and contaminate the food. So the best thing is actually just a very long spoon, so you don't have your hand in the, the actual nitrogen. But yeah. And, uh, you know, the really crazy part about what I do is I actually make a living doing this. Yeah, that'd be great. And, and what I mean by that is, is, you know, I think a lot of people say you gotta have fun at what you do. Well, I've actually, I've created my own market because there was nobody doing this 10 years ago here and there's still really nobody doing this. So, um... Can you talk about your pricing model and when you go and work for the, the sports team and... Yeah, so um, our, our pricing is, is uh, we, we do three different types of events. We usually do uh, mixology, which is the bartending side of this. So like I said, I get people drunk. Uh, we do the food side of this, which is you know full catered events with appetizers and entrees and everything. And then there's the dessert. There's the dessert aspect of this. So that's the ice creams and the floating chocolate truffles and all that other kind of stuff. So. Um, you know, the bars, we usually do $5 per drink. We have the clients supply the liquor. Um, the food is usually, you know, a really good menu with five or six different choices is like 30 bucks per person. Um, our dessert buffets are like six to 12 per person. So it's really, really reasonable. Um, I try to stay competitive with everybody. Um, but we work our model different. Um, so if you go to a typical catering event, you'll have chefs in the back and then you'll have 10 or 12 wait staff passing food and you'll have bus boys and you know there's 40 or 50 different people working. We do what we call entertainment stations. So we take all of the stuff in the back and we move it out front and we actually make the food in front of everybody. So instead of 30 people to, to pull off one of my events, it takes 10 people. So I can cut my labor in, you know, a third. Um, three more? So typically, um, uh, typically, you know, a restaurant runs on a, a very low profit margin. So you're talking 10% if you're lucky. Um, and that's why most restaurants go out of business. Um, I try to run under 20% costs. So I have an 80% profit margin. I don't have a location. So I work out of what's called a commissary. So I share kitchen space with like 30 other businesses. So I just walk in and I work when I work and I punch out. So spend, instead of spending $12,000 on a, on a physical building, I spend $500 a month on rent. So, you know, I've come up with all of these, you know, little things that I do to, because at the beginning, nobody knew what this was and what I was doing. And, um, you know, I have to go out and demonstrate a lot. I have to go out and explain what I'm doing, you know. Well, why don't you, why can't I just, you know, get it from this ice cream store, they're gonna come and scoop it. Why, why would I do this? Well, ma'am, it's not only, you know, a better way to, to make it, but it's also a really cool show. You know, it's really fun for the kids. We can explain science. We can, you know, do this other stuff. So, yeah, it's, um, and I just, I do a large gamut of stuff. You know, I, I cater, uh, I do the speaking engagements. Uh, we've done over 300 school presentations in the last eight years. So we just get to do, you know, a whole ton of different stuff, which is a lot of fun, so. Thank you. It's a double layer also? Yes, it's a, 
it's just like the bowl, so there's a, there's a layer inside. And what's really interesting is, is this container is named after a, a scientist named Dewar. So it's named after him. So Dewar was in competition with this other scientist to figure out what liquid nitrogen was. So his, he didn't figure it out. This other guy, which I can't even remember his name, he actually came up with the process to make liquid nitrogen. Well, Dewar, instead of hanging his head and saying, oh man, I screwed this up, he went and made the thermoses. I mean, that's awesome that this scientist was beat down like that after 20 years of trying to make something, and he turned around and said, you know what? I'm gonna find a different avenue and I'm gonna do something different. That is, that is genius. I'm, I love that guy. I don't even know the guy that made the nitrogen. I love the Dewar guy, so. Yeah, I can. I can make some more up instantly. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Yes. So, um, you know, part of the education kind of thing is I, I really don't like to say no. Um, so I do parties of, you know, I'll have people call me up and I'll, and if I can do it, I always do it. You know, if I'm not doing something on a Tuesday night, then, you know, I'll go out and do a party. But I'll have people call me up and they'll be like, I want to propose to my girlfriend, you know, and I want to do this really cool presentation in my house, and it's just the two of us, and, and what's really unique about my company is, is um, I ask you three questions when you, when you call me. What's your favorite foods? What foods do you dislike? And where did you grow up? And from those three answers, I can write the best damn menu that you've ever had. Because I make you comfortable with the food, because if you tell me you like salmon, then I'll use salmon, but then I'll manipulate all the garnishes and all the other kind of stuff that go with it. So I make you feel comfortable, but then I'll blow you away with, you know, some of the other processes that we do. But yeah, we've done uh, two people, and the biggest event I did was 12,000 people once. So we had, we had over 70 people making ice cream for that event. I cried that night. All right, so I got a little bit extra in here, so as you can see, it'll just dump out on the floor. I'm sorry it took so long. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, guys? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think I'm, I'm most proud of, you know, when I get done with an event and I just sit there and I look around and I look at the people that are working for me and I look at what, what we pulled off and I go, wow, you know, out of all of my experiences, out of all my travels, out of everything that I've done, I bring it together for every single event that I do and it's just that feeling of, yes, you know, we nailed it or, you know, the guests are happier. I have a very, very amazing job. I am able to build memories. Because you think about food, and you think about most of your memories are done around food. You know, the best memories I have of my grandparents, of my great-grandparents, is sitting at their farm, you know, eating swaps beer and nibble around their table and playing cards. Um, They're probably also most videographed. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and being able to build those memories, you know, I actually have people that come up to me 15 years later and say, you know, we had, your, we had a meal at the hilltop, and it was one of the best meals we've ever had, and I proposed to my wife that night. And we, and we remember that, and it's like, wow, you know, you've actually, you know, you've actually, you know, done, done something pretty cool. You know, I didn't save their life or, you know, do anything like that extreme, but, you know, you, you get to build memories with people, and I think that's, that's pretty incredible, so. I don't do the Weston anymore. Yeah, no more at the Weston. I, I don't work for corporations anymore. Just so, me. So if we all make all the food taste a lot better, how do we keep from weighing 500 pounds a piece and turning into Wally World? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, the miracle fruit. I mean, yeah, is, is a great example of, you know, being able to trick your palate and being able to trick, you know, your senses into, yeah, thinking that it's something that it's not. So, yeah, it's, it's, Food is a very gluttonous thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, you know, we need it to survive, but then there's the other side of the spectrum where, you know, there's, there's so many components that can be bad for you. 
You know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the worst, I have the worst sugar tooth in the world, and I get that from my great-grandfather. You know, I, I love sugar and desserts and all that other kind of good stuff, and it's just a matter of, you know, trying to find a different way or, you know. So can you blame your grandparents? Oh, yeah. I do that every single day. <laughs> That's a great question. So, um, and that's something that I raise with the, with the school children when I go in. I say, you know, where do you think we're going to be seeing this in the next 20 years? I really think that everybody's going to have nitrogen at their house in the next 20 years. I mean, think about a machine that, that we already have that changes nitrogen gas into liquid nitrogen. So say everybody had that at their house. We could take liquid nitrogen and use it for so many different aspects in the home use. We could use it to cool our homes. A lot of people have gardens now, so anytime you go into a grocery store, if you see IQF fruit or vegetables, that's individually quick frozen. So that's how you preserve vegetables and fruits in your freezer. So, you know, everybody that has gardens, they could use it to preserve all their stuff at the end of the year instead of canning everything. Um, you know, we could use it to make all these textures and, um, yeah, it's just, I, I really think that, you know, if the technology allows us, you know, that'll be self-sustained and, you know, everybody could be using it for home use. Um, you can use it to clean your floors. Um, if you pour it on the floor, it'll actually take all of the dirt and it'll take it to the lowest point on the ground. It's really, really cool. It's expensive as hell, but... <laughs> So what the vacuum chamber does is it, it opens the cell wall. So all of the liquid that's in that bag, it rushes into the individual cell of whatever you're doing. Alcohol and fruit are the best thing in the world because you take like cherries and put a little bit of brandy in there and put it in the vacuum sealer and it'll pull all of the brandy into the, the actual cellular wall of that cherry. So when you eat it, it's not like it's just marinade because marinade it only penetrates for as long as it's in the marinade. So it's, you're talking about an outer thing, usually, when you're talking about a marinade. So this is pulling it in a molecular level all the way inside of that, that cell. That industrial vacuum is only $1,200? Yeah, the one that I, you, how much did you guys pay for yours? Yeah, about $1,000. So. And they're little tabletop units, you know, they weigh about 100 pounds, but, I mean, you can use it for just a ton of different stuff. Yeah. I like loud. This <laughs> week. So that's like 120 proof cherry. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah we do a. I'm doing a pop up at the source. Um, that'll probably be in three weeks, and we're gonna do what's called edible drinks. So everything is gonna be non-drinkable form. It'll all be edible form. So there's a, pla there's a place in England now that they have figured out how to uh, aerate uh, gin. So they put you in a full garb and they send you into a room. Okay, you step into this room and you come out wasted because it's just it's in the air. So you just inhale for like a minute and then they take you out of this room. It, it, it hits your bloodstream so quickly because it's, yeah. So, so since you're in Colorado, are you cooking with marijuana yet? I am not. I've had a lot of people. How about that flavor? I, yeah, I just, it, it's, yeah. I try to stay away from all, all of that stuff. Yeah. So would you have a hangover? If you did what? You got drunk on the, on Yeah. Oh, yeah. You'd have a worse, you'd have a. Yeah, your head would just be nasty the next day. Yeah. Do I smoke cigarettes? No. A lot of 
people I know are in the cooking industry and a lot of them smoke and we watch a lot of the cooking shows and they smoke and you talk about super tasters, you can't taste anything yep. if you smoke. Yourself. Exactly. And I don't understand how it goes together. Exactly. Well, I mean, smoking for the restaurant people is, is a way to get away for 10 minutes and get your little break. I mean, it's probably the, for the same with a lot of people in a lot of industry, but yeah, it messes up your taste buds. You know, if you want to, if you want to be a strong super taster, then yeah, never start smoking. So. Um, so that tank of nitrogen to fill was only $30, so it's not bad. To buy that tank new, when I bought it 10 years ago, was $3,200. So some crackhead, I live in uh, Cheeseman Park, stole one of these out of the back of my truck the other day. So I had to purchase a new and it was down to 800 bucks. So everything is like a fourth or a fifth of what it was. Um, I have a company called L2O, they're out of uh, Oklahoma. Um, I was using air gas, uh, so they supply pretty much all the medical industry. Um, but an air gas tank was almost $700 delivered, and my new company is about 150 bucks delivered. So it's, it's a lot cheaper. So I have a 180 liter tank at my kitchen, so that weighs over 600 pounds. Yeah, so they come with a big truck, and they fill that big thing up, and then they wheel it into my little cage, and then I have these little tanks that I go. And then when I have really big parties, they'll, they can deliver one of those big tanks for me. So when we do like over a thousand people, we just have one of those big ones delivered. Yeah, I can do a party for like 80 people with that tank. So uh, that's, uh, that's 25 liters, so it's like 19, 20 gallons. So, um, so that's enough to make three different kinds of ice cream, and then we do like four or five different toppings. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really bad. Don't even ask me on their conversions. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a great question. There's, there's food grade, liquid nitrogen, and then there's medical grade, liquid nitrogen. And same with the tanks. So if you ever buy a used, let me take that back. Don't ever buy a used tank. Because you don't know where that, if it was used in specimens or, or exactly how it was used for. So I, I always buy all of my food grade stuff new. And yeah, you gotta make sure that you get, you know, food grade nitrogen, because some... No, not really. I mean, if, if you... Well, yeah, if you bought a used one... We had a girl, and we were talking about buying one, and she's like, look, I work in a lab, and we use those, and you don't want to know where they're going. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, they say they're clean. Yeah, same advice. Yeah. Diseases, and yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a centrifuge. So I bought a centrifuge off of eBay that's on a truck somewhere coming. So I had to buy all the new little things that go into the centrifuge. Um, and they wouldn't tell me what it was used for. So happy eating. <laughs>